And here we are in the month of glow season where we definitely need to be on the lookout for danger. Um, hey Dees, you find Dees illuminated by only the glow of his hollow screen. It's easier to read when it's dark, he explains. There's less glare. This is the best season. I mean, it sure is pretty. Ah, there's that crystal shard. Hey, Anemone. Yep, she's playing. Uh, hey, Mom. Yeah, um, I'm gonna work on self-defense so that if something happens, I'll be able to protect myself. So, defense training. Attendance at self-defense class is always a little higher during GLOW. It's almost as if the imminent threat of attack makes people worried for their lives. Okay, so here's two, two, three, four. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay. Uh, six, and then we can switch that out. And now we have 22, enough to win. Okay, oh, oh. Another year, another glow. Everyone's pretty sure there's going to be an attack this year, so the colony is on high alert. You're collecting glow flies in geoponics gardens with Cal and Anemone when the sirens begin to wail. You all stop what you're doing and look at each other nervously. Your parents run off to help defend the farms, telling you to get inside the greenhouse and stay quiet. And then many declares that she is going to the walls to watch the soldiers fight. She knows a good spot. We should stay safe. You and Cal do as you're told when an enemy heads for the walls. You manage to push a trunk of gardening supplies across the door. They're automatic doors, so it won't stop them from opening, but at least it'll buy you a few more seconds to run away if something tries to come through. Cal looks at the glass ceiling and walls. If they come through the door, he mutters. He shows you a good hiding spot, and together you curl up and try not to make any noise. I just hope nobody gets hurt, he mutters, hiding his face in his knees. After a while, the all-clear rings through the colony. You and Cal come out from your hiding place to creep back outside in the distance. You see the two of the largest fields have been torn up. Cal shoots you a worried look, and you go back to collecting glow flies in silence. Your mom and dad survey the damage with grim, tight body language. Your parents are arguing quietly at your little table. I'm telling you, it wasn't a fluke, your mom says. They're not, they're not just wild animals. They have a plan. The fields, the lights. Okay, your dad replies, taking her hands across the table. We have to tell people what we saw in geoponics. They look up, noticing you in the doorway. Your dad's worried expressions quickly changes to a smile. Hey, Redbug, what happens in the field? Your mom stands up. Don't worry about it, she snaps. Go to bed, it's late, and we have a lot of work to do in the morning to clean up. Okay. Well, are we? Ooh, it shows that we've aged up and now. Oh, look at us. We look older now. We're so cool. And now we're also age 14. Oh, look at us. Look at us. We look, oh my goodness. Hey, Anemone. Anemone is in the middle of trying her and tying her mane of hair out of the way from her face. Oh, hey, Solana, she says, hair tied between her teeth. Just about to go for a one. Run the cup? Uh, we'll see. Well, hey, Tangent. Tang is tapping away on her hollow screen, smiling to herself. Great news, Solana, she says. According to the antiquated, culturally insensitive reckoning of the metal prow mental prowess once used by humans on Earth, and by that I mean IQ testing, I'm officially considered a genius. She shrugs. Tell me something I do not know. Okay. Um, 
Mars? Oh, hi. Mars scowls over her homework. Today is biology, she says. This is so dumb. There's only one kind of biology I care about, and they don't, and they don't cover it in school. Mars, biology is cool with this little room. Biology is really cool, so you can just chill, okay? Try to appreciate the beauty of biology more than just that. And hey, Dees? You see Dees scrolling through his holopom. I used to watch a lot of videos, he says, frowning. I don't know why. It's all garbage. Who cares about this stuff? It's not real. Dees gestures to the wilderness. That, that's real. Uh, yeah. So, Cal! Oh, look at you! Look at us! We've gotten so grown up looking! We look like real teenagers now! Cal waves at you as you enter the garden, leaning on his shovel. Hey, Solana! He calls, but his eyes look past you. Down the path where Anemone is beating the absolute tar out of a training dummy. Her fierce battle cries echoes across the colony, making Cal wince. She has been going totally hard lately, huh? He says. He scratches his face, smearing dirt across his cheek. She asked me yesterday if I wanted to spar with her. She said it would be good for self-defense. Cal smiles sadly at the memory. I told her I don't want to fight. Not her, not a training dummy, not anything on this planet, for real. I've never seen her get so mad at me. She called me a baby and told me I was just going to end up forcing everyone to protect me because I am weak or helpless or whatever. He seems upset and stabs the ground a few times with his shovel. I just don't think it's right to fight anyone, especially the Xenos. They were here first, he says. What do you think, Solana? Well, sometimes we don't have a choice. I mean, we have to protect ourselves. Jeez, you sound like an adult, Cal grumps. They always tell us to see both sides of an argument, but I tried, and I just... He shrugs. I just think that if you have to hurt someone to get what you need, you don't deserve to have it. But what if our life depends on it? How's that fair? Their life depends on it too, Cal retorts. You can't just decide that you get to live and they don't. What if loved ones are in danger? I mean, that's totally scary, but you kind of shouldn't be putting your loved ones in situations where they could be in danger in the first place. Yeah. Cal looks relieved. I'm glad you think so, too. Sometimes I think about the Xeno I had to kill the first time they exact attacked. Like, obviously I'm glad I'm alive, duh, but now it's dead. His eyes go back to Anemone. She stopped sparring with the training dummy and is looking at the gardeners as she has the drink. Neither she nor Cal wave at each other. It was an accident. I didn't mean to kill it, Cal continues quietly. It just happened. I wish I could tell it I'm sorry. Cal clenches his fist. There's gotta be a way to figure out how to live in peace with all the cool things that live on this planet, he says. Like, hey, look at this weed I saw growing over here. Cal has such strong convictions about one of the things you like best about him, even if some people dis disagree with him. Oh, I learned more about Cal. You spend a few hours with Cal in the garden as he shows off the area that he's getting ready for next to planting season. The adults are already starting to trust him with more planting as he gets older, and he beams with pride when you finally head out. You're just as dirty as he is, but you feel so much lighter. I really like hanging out with Cal. He's such a gentle person and he really cares about other things, about the creatures and animals. That really is one of the things that I love about him. And it said that I learned more about him too. So Lexi, oh, I'm already at 60 friendship with him. So, oh, now we can see like more about him. Physically strong boy who isn't afraid to get in touch with his emotions. Pacifist loves animals. So he's on the more loyal side, but kind of in the middle. He's pretty tough and he's peaceful. And I really like that about him. 
I wonder if there's things like that that we can see about the others. No, no. Okay, so it's just cow that we can see that for. Um, and speaking with getting in touch with our emotions, I think maybe I'll try humanities. Good morning. Good morning, congruence chirps. Today we're going to talk about the formation of the Vertumna group and our decision to leave Earth. It's a very exciting topic, and uh, we think you're finally ready to hear about it. Let's dig in. You know how it started, economic and environmental instability, coupled with the deeply entrenched hatreds thrown into thrown the earth into chaos. And you know how it ended. In that chaos, your parents formed the Fortumna group with a plan to leave earth. Twenty years later, and their starborn children, you slid through the wormhole and ended up here on a planet you called Fortumna. But there's so much you don't know. Congruence pulls a holograph pulls up a hollow projection of an unassuming human with a firm maternal gaze. This is planktonic ascendant Wang Botha Schmidt, she says, the spiritual leader of the Vertumna movement. They were what people called the speculative fiction writer. The Vertumna project proved that their writing through speculative was far from fiction. Wait, a sci-fi author? Yes, Congruence tells you. Their best-selling sell novel, Life Beyond the Einstein-Rosen Bridge, told the story of a fictional utopia on the other side of the real-life anomaly at the edge of the solar system. Scientists have been investigating the wormhole for years, but it took a poet to imagine we could travel through it. Wang Botha Schmidt's writing centered around the idea of humanity building a technological utopia on another world, translated to, to a hundred languages, this was a compelling idea to people at the time, so fans started connecting in vert space. Far from just a book club, these people bonded over their mutual aid amid the increasing unrest in, in their own countries. They were committed to the Wang Botha Schmidt's idea of a future where everyone is treated equally without pre prejudice. But they realized it couldn't be done online, Congruence tells you. They committed to social justice. The group saw the pop the impossibility of forming a truly egalitarian society while also reckoning with their own implicit biases and the diverse context of their real lives. They realized that this was the work of generations and the solutions must look to the future, as Wang Botha Schmidt did. So they got together. The image of a squat concrete building with a rooftop garden replaces the Wang, Wang Botha Schmidt. Around the edges of the classroom, the hollow projector gives the impression of towering walls across, topped with a razor wire. The first Vertumna colony, Congruence tells you. 400 people volunteered to sacrifice their own cultural beliefs to walk through these doors, agreeing to come up with a new way of life that would be taught to their children. Babies were conceived from egg and sperm donors chosen by lottery and raised communally like you as the second generation of the Vertumna group. Those babies were your parents. So they mixed their cultures. The hollow projection now shows the compound under siege. As more colonies were founded, word got out about the Vertumna group's social experiments. Congruence continues, assimilationism was an unpopular ideolo ideology at the time because it had been used to commit terrible genocides on Earth. This, combined with the panic that the Vertumna group was destroying the family unit or raising an army of gene tech super soldiers, brought the colony under attack from all sides. Everyone fears what they don't understand. The image of the burning compound is replaced with the stratospheric on a launch pad. Luckily, the next phase of the Vertumna project was ready to launch. 100 colonists were selected to leave Earth on a colony ship, this to seed a far-flung corner of the universe with new human culture. She smiles. The ultimate goal of the, goal of the Vertumna group was you, children, she says, a generation raised completely unburdened by the troubles that plagued Earth. Isn't that lovely? How, how did they build the ship? Orbital voyages were a hobby for the ultra-rich in an earlier century, so there were several relics to be found in museums, Congruence replies. 
The difficulty was not in acquiring a ship, but making it space-worthy and in the logistics of the launch itself. The group crowdsourced enough funding to purchase and repair the ship. Congruent smiles. As for the logistics, well, you are speaking to the solution right now. I was acquired by a connected group of members along with the gene tech that created you and your parents. The stratospheric was the first manned vessel to navigate the wormhole at the edge of the solar system. Given the state Earth was in when it left, it may have been the last. What was the Earth like? Terrible, congruent shows you some dire demographics. The institutions that had given people the illusion of safety were torn down and wars were rampant, both resource-based and ideological. Large parts of Earth were rendered uninhabitable by climate change, pollution, and nuclear war, especially the critical food-growing regions of the world. The Vertumna group weren't the only ones trying to escape Earth, but as far as we know, we are the only ones to... We are the only... But as far as we know, we are the only success. So then why didn't people like us if we were just trying to make it better? The Vertumna group members have a unique culture, congruence replies, but it's formed from a combination of many heritages from Earth, even the language you speak. Esperanto, I had a feeling that was the language that they were speaking in the game, like amongst themselves, was, into, was invented to bring people together. And don't worry, congruence exclaims, you brought your best heritage with you. You're humans. That's a lot of information. Your head is so stuffed with ideas it might burst. Professor Hall and your parents never mentioned this stuff before. They waited to tell you because they wanted you to grow up without feeling different based on your genetic makeup or family history. It's hard to imagine having different culture than your neighbors. You wonder what that's like. Everyone celebrating different holidays, eating different foods, speaking different languages. Are you missing out or are you better without it? Like the original colonists believed. It's hard to say, as the decision was made for you long before you were born. All you can do is the best. All you can do is be the best Solana you can be. First collectible use is free. Huh. Interesting. So I guess one. No wait, I need to switch these. Okay. And then three, five. Oh, I know. Maybe there's 22. And a win. <laughs> Look at me. Up, up in the corner, I'm sticking my tongue out. What's that for? It's your birthday. You wake up from a night of blissfully peaceful dreams. No nightmares, no premonitions, just a pleasant feeling of contentment. You stretch your arms over your head, blinking in the watery, quiet sunlight that seeps through the porthole window. There are always... Things are always changing on Vertumna, but you can't help but feel like things are changing for yourself, too. Not just your body, but your mind, your emotions, your future. Fourteen is going to be your year. Your parents have been working around the clock since the last attack, trying to get the fields right again in time for this year's planting. Spark snow has already started falling, and every day they come home complaining about having to clear it. They asked you to ping them when you're awake so you can share your birthday breakfast in your quarters instead of sitting shoulder to shoulder with everyone else during breakfast service in the canteen. You fire them a message and lay back in your bunk, watching the dust motes float lazily in the light. After a minute, there's a knock at the door. It's Auntie Sedent. She sweeps into your room in a bustle of skirts and shawls and sits down beside you on your bunk. Oh, look at you, she says. Happy birthday, beautiful. Fourteen years old. She leans in and gives you a motherly kiss on the forehead. It's been years since she took care of you in the children's crèche, but all the kids, kids still call her auntie and think of her as a close relative. Her sweet baking bread smell is comforting as it ever was. She sits back and takes one of your hands in both of hers. Solana, ever since I held you in my arms as a baby, I knew you were, you were so special, so important. 
You're becoming a young woman, and I want you to know I will always be here for you, just like your mom and dad, she says firmly. Thanks, Auntie Seden. She smiles and tucks an unruly lock of your hair behind your ear. I guess you're old enough to call me Aunt Anne now, if, if you like, or even just Anne. Now come on in here, Aunt Anne says, spreading her arms wide. Give us a great big hug. You hug her, enveloping yourself in the warm, familiar softness of her. Over her shoulder, you see Anemone standing in the doorway. Well, her hair anyways. She's been growing it out, and there's no hiding behind and there's no hiding it behind the corner. She skips to your quarters. Happy birthday, bud, she says, bouncing on your bunk. Way to get older, enjoy being two years older than me for a few months. Thanks. It's good you're both here, Anne says. Now that you've both been menstruating for about a year, and Nemeny makes a face and mutters yuck, but Anne continues. You're both eligible for the cessation implant, among other things. It will prevent the bleeding and pain and the emotional roller coasters of your monthly cycle. Anemone? <laughs> Mom! Anemone hollers, gross! Do you have to tell everyone about my cycle? I just don't want to get pregnant, okay? And laughs, well, yes, that is the among other things part, but don't but I don't expect you two to be needing that part in a few years yet, right? Anemone looks disgusted by the prospect, or maybe just by her mom talking about it. Uh, gross, gross. Right, Anemone agrees. She's always like this. You think this is bad? When I got my period, she made me a cake with red gooey center that said, welcome to the woman. <laughs> She rolls her eyes. It's bad enough. I, like, shoot up overnight and get boobs, and I want to cry all the time. She has to go around telling everyone, too. Your parents finally arrive, still damp from the fields, and bringing the smell of crisp, tangy snow on their clothes. Oh, look, birthday visitors, your dad exclaims. Anne, are you staying for breakfast? Anne reaches into her bag and brings out a stack of Tiftons. No, thank you, but I brought your order with me from the kitchen, seeing as I was stopping by. She pats your hand one more time. Happy birthday again, Solana. You'll always be my baby, even when you're all grown up. Your mom shakes her head as Anne and Anemone leave. Oh, Anne, she laughs, sentimental to the core. She starts laying out the cutlery for breakfast. But I don't know how the colony would manage without her and the children's crish, she says, pointing a fork at you. Family is more than the people that birthed you, Solana, and don't forget it. Very true. Well, here we go. Now it's mid-quiet, and I guess we'll figure out what to do next month.